I'm going to share a little bit today some of the um, local data, some of my research results, some of the work that we've done with our, um, well, I'm going to talk about soybeans, soybean planting date. Oh, no, it sounds like it got quiet. Okay. Oh, yeah, I don't really need the microphone that much. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our planting date work that we've done with soybeans. I'm also going to mention some of our other crops. And, you know, spoiler alert, I don't necessarily have any real major changes to recommendations or, you know, new guidelines that we're coming out with. I just kind of am sharing some of our research results and maybe helping you think a little bit differently about managing your planting date or, or making some different decisions about planting date in regards to some of the local and some of the national data, all right? Um, so why is planting date important? Why am I even up here kind of talking about why I'm even wasting my time doing some planting date work? And I will say that this is becoming, you know, kind of a more of a, a more of a major tenant of my research program, and I didn't really necessarily expect it to go in this direction when I joined when I came back to University of Maryland in 2018. But you know, needs arise as as times change, and, and I've seen a lot of questions, got a lot of questions, and had some kind of just personal interest in looking at this idea of planting dates and maybe shifting some of our rotations. Nothing major, but, you know, just thinking about our rotations a little differently. So, you know, folks are thinking about planting date as something that they can control to maybe maximize the growing season, like literally maximizing the amount of sunlight that that plant can intercept in that growing season by maybe pushing that planting date a little earlier. And, you know, maybe folks are thinking about shifting or changing or modifying in some way their planting dates just to maybe optimize their efficiency a little bit and the logistics, right? Um, pandemic has affected everyone in weird ways. You know, maybe you have, maybe you're a little bit leaner on your employees. Maybe you just need to think about how, how do I get everything done at the same time more efficiently? Um, and Or maybe there's some equipment limitations. Um, Maybe you're also thinking about planting date from, you know, kind of my perspective or, you know, your perspective as well, that there's, we're seeing a lot of variability in our early spring weather when we're talking about our summer cash crops. Um, you know, sometimes it's too wet or too cold to get in the field to plant early. Sometimes that wet weather is lasting longer than we thought. And we're like, dang, I wish I would have gotten in the field a little earlier. So, you know, I think weather, you know, from both fronts, maybe on the planting side, but maybe also from the harvesting side too. Um, so planting date is something that maybe is a little bit in the forefront of your mind. Um, and maybe you're thinking about modifying planting date for kind of a risk management um, strategy. You know, we think about this and we talk about this a lot in extension with a lot of our programming. Um, you know, I personally am married to a, an insurance agent, so we talk about risk management and insurance all the time at the dinner table. So it's just something that, you know, kind of I'm thinking about as well. And so maybe you're thinking about how can I kind of manage my risk a little bit when we get these wonky weather events, you know, during planting and maybe during harvesting? How can I kind of mitigate my risk by spreading this out and, you know, not being so um, majorly affected by a sporadic weather event. All right. So I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hands. It's okay. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. But, you know, how many people, again, it's rhetorical. You don't have to answer my questions, but are there folks out there that when you're thinking about planting, there's kind of like a hard and fast rule. I'm going to start with my corn. When I finish with my corn, then I'm going to jump over to my soybeans. Are there people that are, th again, you don't have to raise your hand. It's fine. I'll pretend that a couple people raised their hands. All right. If you said you do this, what are some reasons why this may be the conventional knowledge or this might be your planting strategy? All right. Again, I'm, it's rhetorical. I'm not going to wait for anyone to answer me. But here's maybe some reasons why you would consider, uh, you know, I'm going to start with my corn and then I'm going to jump into my soybeans, right? It can be more expensive to plant corn. Maybe you're, maybe you're thinking, you know, soybeans are maybe a little bit more flexible. If I don't get to those soybeans on time, maybe we just wait and we just call them double crop soybeans, right? And so, but I really need to focus and get my corn in first. Or maybe your thought is, well, 
and this isn't wrong, you know, my soybeans are a little more sensitive to those planting conditions. I'm not going to mud in those soybeans. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to get my corn done first, wait till the conditions are better, and then I'm going to jump over to soybeans, all right? Again, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise your hands, but how many folks are thinking this quote, early planted corn is going to yield better, right? I got to get out there and I got to plant that corn early because it's going to yield better, all right? Someone's saying it because I literally pulled that from an extension fact sheet that I read from the Midwest. So there's people that are thinking this, all right? So let's take a look at the relationship between corn yield and planting date, all right? Whenever I'm looking for advice, guidance, sage wisdom about corn production, I always turn to Bob Nielsen, who's a retired corn uh, agronomist out at Purdue, because without fail, he usually has a fantastic graph or figure that he's already taken the time to make, and I can just steal it from him. All right? Now, granted, his data is from Indiana, but I think it shows us a really good point. All right? So if you said, Early planted corn yields better. I'm going to push to make sure that I plant my corn early to get higher yields. This graph does not agree with that, all right? What we are looking at here on the x-axis, this is all data that's just pulled online from the National Ag Statistics. Again, this is from Indiana. This is the percentage of the acres in Indiana that was planted by April 30th, all right, Pre pretty early. And then what we're looking at on the y-axis here is the deviation from the overall state trend for corn yield, all right? So each one of these points is a year between 1991 and 2021. And so what he did was he said, all right, for the percentage of the acres that were planted by April 30th in that year, this is how it yielded compared to that trend line. So obviously positive is going to be good, negative, it, it yielded lower than what the trend was for the state of Indiana in that year, all right? The takeaway point that I hope you can see that I want you to see is that, yeah, we, draw, we drew a curved line here, but I, those points don't really say anything, do they? Kind of looks like a gunshot, right? There's not a very strong relationship here between planting date, early planting, and that, that yield. We would want to see a nice tight yield. And for those of you in the back who can't see, this R squared value that tells you how well this line fits the point, fits the points is point 0.1. We want that to be as close to one as possible. Weak relationship is what this is saying. Okay? And this is looking at percentage of the acres in Indiana planted by April 30th. And it's really not better when we look at May 15th, right? You figure by May 15th, we should, in most years, more corn should be planted by that time. Maybe it's going to be a stronger relationship. Now, the R squared is only 0.11, still a poor relationship, OK? There's a poor relationship between planting date and corn yield. The reason is there's so many other factors with corn specifically that really impact throughout that growing season that's really going to impact that final yield. It's not really very well tied back to planting date. All right? It's on planting date just happens to be one of that like multitude of factors that's going to affect that corn yield. All right? So maybe with my awesome graphs from Dr. Nielsen, you're thinking, um, well, maybe I need to reconsider this. Maybe there's some forward thinkers among the group, again, no one has to raise their hand, that says, you know what, I'm going to start with all my soybean acres first. I'm going to plant soybeans first, and then I'm going to jump over to corn, because Nicole has done a fantastic job of convincing me that I should. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to convince anyone of that. I was just looking for a chuckle. Thank you to the two people who were listening. All right. <laughs> All right. So why might we consider this strategy, though? Maybe you're like, huh, there's something to what she's saying. Maybe we should consider early planting soybeans versus our corn. All right. Let's talk about what we know about soybeans. Again, this is probably going to be a review for everybody, but we're here and we might as well review it and bring it to the forefront of our minds. All right. Generally, we think about soybeans. They're much more sensitive to a lot of these conditions, population, row spacing, soil conditions, right? How, I mean, really, are we really doing a whole lot of corn space, uh, row spacing and corn research? No, but there's still questions out there about optimizing row spacing for soybeans, right? So we know that inherently these, these crops are more sensitive to those kinds of conditions, right? When we think about soybeans, I, this is my little pat on my back to myself for all the effort that I put in to do the variety trials, right? When we're thinking about variety selection for our soybeans, I, I like to think that it's 
people probably think that's more important in soybeans than corn, right? Maturity group is important when we're thinking about soybeans, okay? Nah, maybe not so much in corn, all right? So variety selection is important when we're thinking about soybeans. When we think about how soybean plants grow, mature, and, and end up to yield, which we're gonna kind of go through here in a second, day length or night length is really important. Not so much in corn, right? We really have to be paying attention to planting date and number of hours of daylight for that transition to reproductive growth in soybeans. Corn, it really doesn't matter, all right? so. Again, probably reviewed everybody, but I found this awesome image on the internet and so I wanted to share it with everyone, all right? So how does day length change over the year? Sometimes I feel like we know this, but it's, it's nice to see it visually. I'm 100% a, a visual learner, all right? So let's orient ourselves to what we're looking here, all right? As we move from the left side of the screen to the right, you can see um, days of the year, and you, it kind of follows the calendar, all right? So over here on the left side, this is January 1, and as we're moving to the right side of the screen, that's December 31st, all right? So this is the, the as the year, chronologically, as the year goes along. What we're looking at here on the y-axis is latitude, all right? So northern hemisphere, as we move from the middle up, here's the equator, and then southern hemisphere. All right, and I, and I just had to use this image that I literally stole from the internet because they just happened to have a nice blue line right about where our latitude was, all right? So the blue line at 40 degrees north that's running across the, across the screen here generally represents us, okay? And then the different colors that we're seeing represents the hours of daylight. We've got a, a marker here at the, the spring equinox, June solstice, the longest day of the year, and then the fall equinox, and then the shortest day of the year, all right? And those are based on us, based on our uh, roughly 40 degrees, all right? So what we're visually looking at here is the numbers of hours of daylight and how it changes as we move when we can just zoom in and kind of focus on the growing season, all right? And we see that we kind of shift from, you know, 12, 13, 14 out. Oh, here, I'll put the, the red bar so everybody knows where we're looking at here, right? 13, 14 hours, we hit that solstice of maybe around 15 hours of daylight, and then we start backing off, and then we start kind of slowing down. It's this really slow transition in the number of hours of daylight, that is what signals our soybean plants that it's time to go reproductive, it's time to start producing those seeds, okay? This is really important, and we really need to be thinking about this, especially as we relate it back to our planting date, okay? Not, not necessarily as important in corn. Okay, why is this daylight really important? Let's think about what soybean yield is. How, when we're talking about yield, we're talking about the number of seeds that we form on that soybean plant, in the number of pods on that soybean plant, based on the number of nodes or flowers that can develop. All right, thinking about this, corn and soybeans are different. All right, this is based on vegetative growth. All right, more vegetative growth in that soybean will increase our yield. This is much more flexible than corn. Doesn't matter how tall that corn plant is, you're gonna get one, maybe two ears, all right? Doesn't matter, vegetative growth on that corn plant doesn't matter. What matters is the number of seeds on that ear. You, you can't all of a sudden add three, four ears to that corn plant. I don't know, maybe you can. If someone works for a seed company and that's what you're breeding, awesome, I have no idea. All right, but what I know is that you get one to two ears per plant of corn and that's it. There's not that same flexibility as there is with soybeans. All right, so folks are thinking, this has been kind of the impetus of our doing this research, you know, soybeans are becoming a little bit more valuable now. And how can we increase our soybean yields? What can we control? What are some cultural practices, some management practices on our farm that we can control that can potentially increase our soybean yields? So. We want to increase the number of seeds in the number of pods, in the number of nodes. We need more vegetative growth, all right? We do this by extending the growing season, but not necessarily on the tail end, right? We need to increase that growing season, extend that growing season by planting early, all right? There are other benefits, besides just yield, of planting early. We can expedite that canopy development. Again, maximizing the amount of sunlight that that plant can take in over the growing season also helps with weed management as well, all right? But that's Kurt's 
bailiwick. I'm not going to talk about that. All right. The plants are able to transpire more water. You're kind of shifting when that really high temp, high and dry temps during the summer, shifting it so it's away from when that plant is going through pod fill. All right. So trying our best to maybe avoid that plant being in drought stress during pod fill. All right. And the soybean plants through early planting can spend more time in this vegetative growth stage. All right. Why is this important? This next slide, this is so cool. I learned this recently, and I just think that this is amazing. All right. So how does this translate to yield by maximizing vegetative growth? Once your plant reaches V1, all right, node development in soybeans is time dependent. You get a new node every 3.7 days as that soybean moves from V1 to R5. Completely time dependent, not related to temperature, not related to anything else, just literally the number of days. All right. So more nodes by more days that that plant is in that vegetative growth stage. So early planting, you hit V1 earlier. You've got more day length before those plants are signaled to turn reproductive for vegetative growth. You're going to hit R1 earlier. When you plant soybeans later, they just cannot catch up. There's not enough days left, right? There's just not physically enough days in the calendar for those later planted soybeans to catch up prior to that longest day of the year. All right, this is like fascinating. I don't know, mind blowing to me. Maybe because I'm a nerdy researcher. All right, so maybe maybe your brain just had a little pew moment, and you're like, well, should I prioritize planting soybeans over corn? I don't know, Nicole's a pretty good speaker. She's kind of convincing me about it. All right, well, let's take a look at some data. All right, I stole this image because, you know, who has time to make their own grass, graphs anymore from Mark Licht, who is the agronomist out in Iowa. All right, so what we're looking at here is a comparison of soybeans in green and corn in yellow. All right, along the x-axis is your planting date. And along the y-axis is relative yield, all right? So take a minute, take a look at this. What is this graph telling you, all right? The major thing that I'm seeing here, I'm going to show you with an arrow in a minute, is when we look at this deviation from 100, right? Where do we start seeing that relative yield drop off comparing corn and soybeans, all right? We see the drop off in corn before we see it in soybeans, right? We see that yellow, yellow line start to drop where that green line stays straight a little longer. All right? So this is telling me corn yield potential drops off before soybeans. Or, you know, you can flip it the coin, soybean yield potential remains higher longer. Or late, oops, sorry, late planting impacts corn more than soybeans, all right? You could draw any of those interpretations from this graph, okay? You think about this in any way. So now you're like, well, dang, Nicole's really confusing me. Now she's telling me I should prioritize planting my corn, right? I'm not telling you either of those things. The point that I'm trying to make is that the optimum planting window for both corn and soybean is the same, all right? You got to try to get everything done at the same time. All right, and maybe it's not the best strategy to focus on start with one crop, wait till you're finished, and switch over to the other. Right? Maybe you got to start making some individualized decisions on a field by field basis. Maybe you're still limited by your logistics of your equipment, and you just can't do it. All right? I'm just simply throwing out food for thought, and we're going to look at some data, and we're going to see what we found here in Maryland. All right? I don't think that there is a clear answer for all of your operations. All right? and in any given year. I think it's best to understand, and what I'm hopefully going to kind of share with you guys, are the risks of early planting. We're going to focus on soybeans and um, the potential that you're going to get a reward in any given year. All right? So some of the risks of early planting, again, you all are familiar with this. We're just going to lay it out so everyone's on the same page, right? Emergence and germination for corn and soybeans are tied to soil temperature. All right? You can't just start early because you want to start early. You got to hit a threshold, all right? Early planting, you expose your your you expose that, you know, baby seed to pest pressure, 
potential root rot pathogens, late season frost, all right? This graph that I stole from uh, NOAA, and I zoomed in on us, Maryland, here. I know it's a little hard to see the, the color change here, but, you know, day of last spring freeze for between 81 and 2010, we range in this state anywhere pretty much the whole month of April, all right? So what does that tell me? April is a tricky dang month to try to figure out how to get out in the field and predict if you're going to have uh, a freeze, all right? I took a page from Paul Geringer's playbook. He's not even here to say it, but I saw this meme, and I thought it was funny. No one laughed the first time I put it up, and I'm not seeing anyone laughing now, but, you know, we live in Maryland. It, did anybody remember watching this show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Okay, good. The last audience I said this to, like, looked at me dumbfounded, like they never watched TV before. So, all right. Welcome to Maryland, where the weather's made up and the seasons don't matter, right? We, it's really hard to make predictions because... April can go, you know, one or two ways here in Maryland. Uh, all right? All right. Wet soils. I have to say that this picture on the left is one of my, like, favorite pictures that just breaks my heart, right? Look at that poor little seedling trying its darndest to bust out of that soil that has just been so badly crust, crusted over, all right? It's, like, one of my favorite pictures that just breaks my heart. Um, so, you know, you... Get your seed out there too early. The soils are too wet, basically swamped and crusted on the top and can't bust out, all right? And then we have this issue of slugs, which is, you know, Kelly Hamby's bailiwick. I don't even go there, but it, it's an issue, right? There's a lot of risks of early planting, especially here uh, in Maryland, which is why we need to collect some of this local data. I love looking to the Midwest and kind of get some information on what they're doing, but at the end of the day, we need to collect the data here so we can understand our local conditions better. So. This led to the development of our research question and where we've been kind of focusing our efforts in terms of our soybean planting date work the past couple years. Um, so will early planting impact soybean yield? We hypothesized that it would. We hoped that we would see that early planting would increase yield. And we did this across maturity groups and multiple locations across the state. Um, and then in a partnership with University of Delaware, Dr. Jared Miller, who's my counterpart, we looked at nutrient status at R1. Um, will that be impacted in any way from... Uh, early planting date. And I do want to thank, I don't think any of them are here today, but I do want to thank uh, Maryland Soybean Board for generously funding this research um, over the past few years and their continual support of uh, my research program. So uh, the data I'm going to show you, I'm just going to focus on our Maryland data, but I wanted to let you know that this originated, this project originated at University of Delaware with Jared Miller back in 2020. I jumped on board in 2021, and we both performed it in 2021 and 2022 together. So when Jared started this project, he started just with one variety, and it was a, you know, a mid-group four uh, maturity group. When I jumped on board in 2021, uh, Soybean Board said, well, one maturity group is just not enough. We have to look at it across multiple maturity groups. So I grabbed anything from a late group three up to an early group five. We looked at these four maturity groups, and then that ended up being a lot. So we backed down just to the um, group four, the group four four that Jared provided me in 2022. But... I've got some interesting data that I will share with you. So all hope is not lost, all right? So uh, Jared and I were looking to try to get a, a good picture across the whole state. So we performed this study um, all the way out Western Maryland, Keatesville, Central Maryland, Clarksville, Y Research and Education Center, just down the road. Uh, we did 15 inch row spacing, no till. We started mid to late April, depending on how quickly we could get our act together, depending on how quickly the folks at the centers could get their act together. And then we staggered uh, the planting date two weeks apart based on that first starting date. Um, we collected soil and tissue samples at about R1, just from that maturity group 4-4 bean. And then we obviously collected yield um, on all of those plots. So. I'm not going to share the results from the 2021 where I looked at the four maturity groups because I, there really wasn't anything exciting to show there. So I'm just going to focus in on that group 4-4 bean, um, and we'll look at kind of how it changed from 2021 up to 2022. Um, so 
let's orient ourselves to the, our graph here. On the x-axis, we have Julian date. That basically just says that January 1st is day number one, all the way to December 31st, which is day number 300, I'm sorry, 365 uh, at the end of the year. It's a really nice way to make these scatter plots and really get a feel for the different planting dates. So if I would have just said planting date one, planting date two, planting date one was different at our three locations, all right? So where most of my graphs, you're gonna see this Julian date. And for those of you who are like me and you don't know what Julian date 125 is, I have, I have told you what that date corresponds to in the calendar, all right? And then on our y-axis here, we're looking at soybean yield in bushels per acre, all right? Now, the three different colors in the graph show you the three locations. So gray is uh, Clarksville, Central Maryland, Keatesville, Western Maryland, and uh, Y is here in red. So we hypothesized that that early planting would increase yield. Did we really see that? We didn't really see much of anything, right? Much of, a, much of a pattern at all. I was really hoping to see high yields and really see it drop off. And I, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm always disappointed when my hypotheses don't shake out the way I think they're going to. So, yeah, that was kind of disappointing uh, in 2021. Let's jump forward and look at 2022. Again, Julian date down here with the actual planting dates of the calendar and yield, slightly higher yields in 2022. This was the same variety, by the way, the exact same variety from 2020 all the way through 2022. Um, maybe a little bit of a pattern here at Keatsville, but you know we had pretty high variability, nothing really statistically different. So I don't know, I was a little bummed to see this. I always like to see really good, strong results that I can share with you guys, right? But this is the reality of research that we don't always see a response. We don't necessarily always know why at this point. So, you know, based on these, uh, this data, across two years and three locations, there really wasn't that clear, solid response that we were hoping to see of increased yield with early planting date. So I like to say that my job while you guys think my job is to answer questions, I think my job is just to ask more questions so that I can just keep having a job, right? It's job security for me. But, you know, we like to look back and we want to say, what did we do wrong and, and how can we make this better? So did we not start early enough, right? I don't know. I started about as early as I could. I couldn't get those beans to the farms any earlier than than I could. So maybe we could have started earlier, but there was definitely logistical limitations on our part. So maybe we could have... I don't know, I think the farms were a little scared to maybe start earlier than that too, which I don't blame them. Would 30 inch row spacings have an, have impacted the results? I, I think so possibly. I've seen some research from the Midwest that, you know, I think, and I think we know that anyone who's maybe switched row spacing, you, you know, there's definitely a little more risk associated with that bare soil in between those 30 inch rows. So maybe, maybe I would have seen a benefit if we did it on 30 inch rows. Let's take a look at how this translates to nutrient status. I will admit I only put this data in here because Jenny told me that was the title she wanted me to talk about. I, I didn't think it was particularly exciting. Jared and I do these studies sometimes together where we, you know, take soil and tissue samples and we just kind of look at all the nutrients and we hope that some kind of relationship is going to jump out at us sometimes. Not necessarily that we, we have a prediction. We just like to see kind of what's happening, nutrient status in the soil and the plant at these different times with these different treatments. And so um, I personally hate doing these kinds of studies, but I, I humor Jared and we work together on these kinds of things. So I just have the 2021 data. I don't think I have the results back for the 2022. These were the tissue samples. We collected these tissue samples when the plots reached about R1. So what I did was I took all this data, threw it into my statistical software, and I was trying to see if there was a relationship between yield and the nutrient concentration of these individual nutrients in the tissue, okay? And, you know, Jared and I are really great at setting up field research. We were able to have enough power to be able to use statistics that we could look at these relationships between yield and nutrient concentration at each location by planting date. Right? So we could really tuss out if those early planted beans had some kind of difference in the nutrient status because they were planted early versus the same beans planted late at the same farm in the same field, all right? So we had a lot of power to be able to pull out these relationships. So 
I threw this all in my statistical software and, you know, very limited information kind of popped back that really meant anything, all right? So the first thing that came through that I thought was interesting, this is looking at Clarksville, so Central Maryland, and this is the last planting date, which I hesitate to call late. It wasn't really late per se. It was kind of more on like the normal planting date. All right. So what did we see? And those of you guys who have seen soil talks before, who have maybe some interest in, you know, the different cation ratios, maybe right away you're looking at this like, oh yeah, right? Calcium, magnesium, potassium. Some of you guys have seen this relationship before. So what did we find? Again, this was Clarksville, Central Maryland, the last planting date. All right. When we look at the R, I mentioned we want this to be as close to one as possible. Positive means that both yield and that nutrient are increasing together. Negative means there's an opposite relationship. So as one factor is increasing, the other factor is decreasing. All right. And then the p-value, we want this to be as low as possible. That tells us, yeah, that's a significant and a strong relationship there. So we actually saw pretty strong relationships here. So yield and calcium, as, as soybean yield increased, calcium decreased. Yield and magnesium, as soybean yield increased, magnesium concentration decreased. Yield and potassium, as soybean yield increased, potassium increased. All right. We know that this relationship exists. We know that this relationship sometimes exists in that soil, potassium and the relationship between magnesium and calcium. Why did we only see that in the last planting date? I don't know. I don't know yet. I haven't really dug into this data. Jared and I need to sit and talk about it. This is visually what that relationship looks like. I told you all I'm a visual learner. I can't look at those numbers on a screen. It means nothing to me. All right. So we have correlated against each other the yield versus that concentration of the nutrient in the tissue. All right. We see potassium increasing, yield increases, nutrient concentration increases, and we see calcium and magnesium decreasing. All right. That's, this is just visually what all those words said on the last slide. But again, this was at one location, one planting date. Got to figure out what that means. All right. The only other kind of exciting, interesting, you know, confirming relationship we saw was at Y, and this was in that early plant date, all right? Basically, we saw similar results as we saw at Clarksville in that last planting date. As soybean yield increased, calcium concentration decreased. As soybean yield increased, magnesium concentration decreased. Again, visually, that's what that looks like. Looks almost similar to what we saw at Clarksville. All right, same relationship, yield versus tissue concentration. So uh, like I said, I put this in here because Jenny told me I had to talk about nutrient status. Um, we're still trying to, Jared and I are still trying to figure out what this means, um, seeing if he's, I don't even know if he's actually seen the same relationship at his farm down in Georgetown, Delaware. So we will test that out, um, just something to think about. All right, so in 2021, I wasn't really happy with the graph that I showed you where we really didn't see a clear relationship between yield and planting date. And I wanted to believe that maybe it was because we weren't looking at enough varieties, we weren't looking at enough maturity groups, and Soybean Board definitely wanted to believe that. They were like, please, can we look at this you know, across a wider ranges of, range of conditions? So our compromise was in 2022, I took all of the entries that came into the soybean variety trials. So for those of you who are not familiar, I run the corn and soybean variety trials where we put a call out to the major commercial seed companies in the area and we say, we will test your seeds for you. Give us your varieties, give us your lines. We will put them side by side in the same field across the state, randomized, replicated, and I will give you an, an evaluation and analysis of the performance of your varieties compared to other varieties out there. All right. This is a, a fee service. The companies pay me to run these trials. All right. I also do receive support from Maryland grain producers and soybean board to support our work running these variety trials. Um, so what I did was I reached out to all of the companies and I said, send me enough seed so I can duplicate the entire variety trial. I'm going to take all the entries that come in for soybean variety trials and I'm going to do an early planting date. 
okay? I did this, we only could handle this at two locations, okay? This was a lot. <laughs> so we picked Clarksville on the western shore and the Y on the eastern shore. All right, and we totally duplicated the variety trials, and you can see here we had our early and our regular planting date. Again, you, I look at this, and you can look at it too, and be critical and say mm, that early could have been a little earlier. It definitely could have, but we were dealing with I can't even remember maybe 12 different companies, and I am at the mercy of when FedEx shows up with their seed. All right, so. Could we have gone earlier? Yeah, could we and should we have? Probably, but that was probably the earliest, these were probably the earliest days that we could get in the field at those locations, all right? We plant our variety trials on 30 inch rows because that is what my planter is set up to plant. Um, while we made an effort to put the variety trials, the, the duplicated planting, in the same field, they may not have been at the same field at both locations, but they were darn close enough, all right? So we're going to say that those conditions, the soil and the field conditions, were pretty much the same, all right? So let's, let's set up what we're about to look at before I show you these beautiful graphs that I have made, all right? What I calculated was the yield difference. So for each of the entries, each of the varieties, they were replicated three times both in the early planted and in the regular planted variety trials. So for entry number five, I had three plantings, three, three plots of it in the early planted that I averaged together, and I had three uh, plots in the regular planted trial, and I averaged those together, and I simply calculated the difference. The yield at the regular planted trial minus the yield at the early planted trial, all right? A positive value for this yield difference means that we actually lost yield with the early planting. I'm setting this up so that the graph on the next slide makes sense, all right? However, a negative value is what we hypothesized, that we saw an increase in yield with an early planting, all right? So when we go to the next slide and we look at these two graphs, a negative value is what we hypothesized, what we thought we were going to see, okay? All right, so let's take a look at that. This is Clarksville, so our western shore location, all right? On the x-axis here, when the entries come into us, we just give them a number. I don't care what company they come from, doesn't matter to me. They're just entry one, two, three, four, five, all right? So, and I'm not gonna tell you what they are because I don't know, all right? So along the x-axis here, we've just numerically numbered all of those entries, all right? On our y-axis here is that yield difference. So here's zero. Zero would mean we got the same yield with early planting as we did with regular planting. Again, positive value, we saw a decrease with early planting. A negative value, we saw an increase with early planting. So we expected that this is where most of our entries would be, all right? The different colors represent how I break out the maturity groups for our variety trials, all right? Group three, early group four is a four zero to a four four. A four five to a four nine is what we call a late group four, okay? And if you guys are diligently sitting here trying to count the points, I gave you a little shortcut and I counted them for you, all right? So for Clarksville, we can see that the majority of our entries ended up where we saw a yield increase with that early planting. Again, this isn't statistical. This is just real quick and dirty, just a quick you know, general idea of performance of those varieties at Clarksville. All right, so I was a little happier when I saw this data. I was like, all right, now we're kind of like, we're tussing something out here, we're seeing something, all right? So that was Clarksville. Let's look at the same results for our Eastern Shore location here, Y Research and Education Center. Everything else is the same, entry number along the bottom, and here's our zero. All right, again, we hypothesized that the majority of our entries, we were hoping that our entries were gonna be down here, see a yield increase with early planting. We add in group fives that get planted on the eastern shore as part of our test, so that's what the yellow dots are for. And again, if you're sitting here diligently trying to count these, I did it for you. Not as clear of a relationship as we saw at Clarksville, huh? So. Some of them, I, those early group fours, the majority of those entries actually we saw a yield decrease with early planting, all right? The late group fours though, it was the complete exact opposite. So we're gonna repeat this again this year. I definitely think these results are you know, year and weather dependent, so we're gonna try it again this year and see what we come up with, but this was just kind of a introduction to some of the data that, that we were seeing. So you know, when we tried to do the same evaluation across more varieties, 
yeah, early planting can result in numerically higher yields, all right? But remember, there was no stats here. Individual results may vary, all right? Different conditions, different years. We'll see if we come up with the same results next year. Is there potentially a location by maturity group interaction? I don't know. Those last two graphs kind of show me that there probably is. All right. Maybe soybean board is onto something. I can't just keep testing this in, in a group four. We need to look across these different maturity groups. Um, you know, we definitely saw a clearer response at Clarksville, a different response by maturity group at Y. I, you know, we saw a little bit of a a uh, difference in nutrient uptake at R1 across our multiple locations. Again, Jared and I need to kind of powwow on this and, and see what we can really interpret from those results. All right. And again, job security for myself. I'm really just asking more questions uh, every time we do research. And honestly, these are some questions that people have asked me when I've shared or talked about these results in the past. All right. How does this early planting scenario, like what are your recommendations in terms of seed treatments? Do we need it? Is it a requirement? Should we absolutely do it? Is it worth the investment? If you talk to Kelly Hamby, who's our extension entomologist, you know, if you know that there are disease conditions present, yeah, it's worth the investment. I don't know necessarily if it's a hard and fast rule. All right. We haven't really looked at that. Be quite honest, it's not really part of our evaluation. All right. I do want to add in that caveat there, depending on the company that you're purchasing that seed from, it may be a requirement. If you're concerned that you might have to replant, it may be required that you have a seed treatment to be able to qualify for replant. So again, just part of your decision making process, keep that in mind because there could be chances that you'd have to replant with an early planting. Does row spacing impact results? Again, it wasn't part of our evaluation. Some of the data that I've looked at from across the country, um, you know, 15 inch row spacing is probably going to be the ideal for early planting. I don't think you need to go as low as seven and a half. Uh, that's the results have not really shown much of a difference between 15 inch and seven and a half inch rows. But there's been some thought that 30 inch rows might be a little too wide for these early planting scenarios, which makes sense based on based on some of the work that uh, that I've seen. So something to think about. All right. So I want to talk about some other crops, too. I, I'm not just doing only planting date research, looking at our soybeans, because I think we really need to be looking at our whole rotations, right? So um, myself and Dr. Alan Leslie, who um, was a, a ag education, a, an ag extension agent over in Southern Maryland, we're interested in maybe looking at wheat, okay? And the same issues that I talked about in the beginning, looking at variability of our weather during the spring and the fall also impacts our wheat planting as well, right? So when we're thinking about wheat, you know, we want to get out there and try to plant as early as possible. We got to hold out for the Hessian fly free date. Um, sometimes we just got to get in the field while it's dry before it starts raining because once it starts raining, it doesn't stop, right? So we're trying to get out there as early as we can and get that weed in the ground. We get better establishment in the fall before we switch to, ver before, you know, that plant vernalizes and, and kind of goes dormant for the winter. And honestly, the question that I get the most is about cover crop benefits, right? Is it worth it? So the question becomes kind of the opposite side of the coin with cover crops, all right? If I can't get in the field early enough to plant my cover crops, how late is too late? to even bother planting a cover crop, right? Is it worth it? W at what point is it not worth it because you're really not getting the benefits of that cover crop? Now, if you're getting paid by one of your programs to get out there and plant, you do what you gotta do to get your payment, right? But at the end of the day, the questions from folks like Maryland Department of Agriculture is, what is really the cover crop benefit of planting in December, of planting a cover crop in December, okay? <laughs> The other thing that's important when we're talking about planting date, especially with our, you know, small grains or winter crops, is planting early, harvesting earlier, so we can get our double crop beans in. All right, Dr. Bob Cradiville, who was my predecessor, did years of work on this at the end of his career, showing that really what was most important for double crop soybeans was getting that wheat off early enough so you could get those beans in the ground. All right, so backing that all the way up to the previous growing season and thinking about getting our wheat in earlier. 
So um, we are in the second year of this study. I obviously don't have the wheat yield data because our wheat is still in the ground for this year, but I've got our data from last year. We picked two locations, Beltsville over on the Western Shore, which is kind of right around near campus, and then uh, Y Research and Education Center. It's almost like my office is at Y Research and Education or for some reason, I keep doing all of my research there. Jeez Louise. Um, and you can see that while I did not ask both of the farms to start the planting date on the same date, they coincidentally did. And they spaced the, the plantings about two weeks. And so we started mid-October with wheat planting all the way out to um, the 6th of December. I'm sure that was fun. I was massively pregnant by that point and not in the field at all. <laughs> all right, so let's look at the results again. On our x-axis here is our Julian date, so the day of the year, and on our y-axis here is our wheat yield in bushels per acre. And red is Beltsville, gray is Y. We did have some statistical difference here. I say we saw a much cleaner relationship of that decreased yield with later planting um, at Y versus over at Beltsville. You could almost call this basically a straight line, which is interesting in that that mid, middle planting date actually statistically had the highest yield. So um, we are in our second year of this. Maybe next year I will report back on this when Jenny invites me back next year. Um, so that's some of the work we're doing with wheat. We are also evaluating planting date with another new and interesting crop, fiber hemp, all right? I know no one's interested and no one cares, and it's fine, but I just wanna show you that these results are really important. And I wanna give you a little explanation of why we at the university are actually interested in looking at this this idea of what is the optimum planting date for industrial hemp, right? So obviously number one is that we want to maximize yield. That's our goal with every crop, right? And, and if you can't see, because the lighting is a little difficult here, so this is our fiber hemp that we grew last year. It was about 14 feet tall. And if you can't tell, that is my graduate student, Erin, like literally buried in the middle of those, those crops. I was like, hey, you, get out there in that field so we can actually see how tall it is. And you know, she's average height, probably about my height. So. Um, and it may be a little hard to see, but on, on her uh, right versus her left, these are actually two different planting dates. And you can see there's a little bit difference in height there, and I'm gonna show you the yield data um, in a second. So, you know, part of our motivation here is we want to be prepared for whatever kind of market maybe we'll develop for hemp. We wanna be ready on the university front to be able to have growing recommendations for folks that might be interested in growing this crop. And number one, we don't even know when we should start planting this stuff, okay? My interest is that if we are going to start growing hemp on more of a, you know, of an actual like agricultural commodity scale, what I think is most important is that hemp needs to fit into our rotations, right? Our current rotations. We're not going to adjust our rotations for hemp. Hemp needs to be able to figure out how to fit into what we're already doing now, right? And so that was my goal is how do we fit fiber hemp into our current crop rotations because we can't plant everything at the same time, right? I've already probably instilled enough question in your brain just in this last, you know, 45 minutes about if you should start with corn or soybeans. Now I'm throwing in a whole nother crop and you're like, Nicole, I can only do so much at one time. I get it. All right. So that's why we are evaluating and trying to figure out what is the optimum planting date for hemp. And you'll see here, this is just uh, one year's worth of data. It took us about three years to find a variety of hemp that would actually grow here. So we found one, and we were able to um, evaluate. You'll see this is just fresh yield. So we cut down all those trees, and we weighed them uh, fresh in terms of tons per acre. It really doesn't mean anything at this point. Um, I, what I think is interesting is that we see that really steep drop off with that last planting date um, in terms of our yield. And we're really seeing, I would say, a pretty strong relationship that this early planting is really going to be much more beneficial for hemp. What we're going to do this year is maybe push that early planting date even earlier. It would be really nice to be able to tell folks that you could just get hemp out early. Just get your hemp out and be done with it. And then you can move on to your actual crops that you care about. Right? So that's what we're hoping we will see um, eventually here. Planting date, 
is especially important in a crop like hemp that reminds me a lot like soybeans. It's really sensitive to the day length, to the photo period, all right? So we're really paying attention to when we are planting this crop, how much sunlight it's able to intercept, when it starts to turn reproductive so that we can pay attention to harvest date, all right? So, all right, some more questions for our research. I think I've alluded to this as we've gone through the presentation. Hopefully I'm doing okay on time, all right. Are we not planting early enough to consistently see that increase in yield? Are we just missing that window? Is that window even really there, that sweet spot where if we do plant early enough, we're going to see an increase in yield? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that maybe we're not hitting it, right? But then you've got that balance of how early is too early. I mean, I don't care. I'll put seed out there and let it like die. It doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt my bottom line, right? If anyone should do it, it should be me. Have me put out, put that plant, put those seeds out too early and then they all die, all right? But how early is too early? We're trying to find that sweet spot. Are we just in a weird client climate that maybe we can push earlier? I don't know, but then I look at that that map of the United States with that last frost and it's like pretty much the whole month of April. So, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, would ultra early planting or earlier planting help with your logistics? Again, a rhetorical question, just something for you all to be thinking about, all right? Are there other kind of financial gains or savings from early planting? This is, uh, I mean, another rhetorical question, but legitimately a question that I don't always think about from the research side, right? Is there some other kind of benefit, earlier purchasing seed, early delivery of seed, I don't know, I'm, I'm asking, that's a legitimate question. Is there some other kind of financial gain or savings from early planting that you as an operator would go, hmm, maybe I should consider that? Again, just throwing that out there. All right, so my recommendations, which aren't really much of recommendations, but my summary of all the data that we've looked at is that there is a risk reward balance associated with this early planting. And the trouble with this is, is that we cannot always predict it, all right? Maryland Soybean Board flat out told me they wanted the results of my research to pretty much adjust the university recommendations to say that we should plant soybeans earlier than we, we are. And I'm gonna tell you, I haven't seen strong enough data to even consider changing those recommendations, okay? It's just, the data just are not there. Um, we can't always predict where there's going to be a benefit from that early planting. I stole, this was a direct quote from Dr. Mark Licht from his fact sheet that I looked at where I stole his beautiful graph from, all right? And I, I really chewed on this I really chewed on this quote for a few days, and that's why I wanted to share it, because I've really been chewing on it, all right? Early planting can result in higher yields, but there is not a higher yield potential with early planting every year, all right? So what that says to me is like, that's like a Las Vegas, right? Like, you could get earlier, or better yields with early planting, but it's not consistent enough. It's not consistent enough. It's not necessarily increasing that yield potential every year, which, like, you know, shies me away from really making any major recommendations. All right, when you're thinking about adjusting planting date on your operation, again, these are, I don't have answers to these questions. These are questions that you should ask yourself. How risk averse are you? Will the reward from early planting outweigh the risk? I don't know. It depends on what that reward is to you, okay? Is that reward a savings in time? Is there, is there some, time, some type of solution to your planting logistics or even harvesting logistics that early planting would benefit you? Again, questions you need to ask yourself. Is there a consistent yield increase? I've had folks come up to me after I give this talk saying, on this field, you know, on my field 15, I see an increase every year in early planting soybeans. Great, keep planting them early then, all right? I can't capture that, your individual data with my research, but if you're seeing it year after year, go ahead, plant early, all right? Is there, is the price of soybeans such that the reward is outweighing the risk? Again, I don't know, this is a, these are questions you ask yourself. All right, but what I'm gonna conclude with is that there's really no blanket recommendation here for early planting. I am not to that point yet. I have not seen anything concrete in our local data that leads me to believe that we should be changing anything yet. We're gonna keep, we're gonna keep chasing down this question. Hopefully we can zero us in maybe on where that early planting window is. That's if Soybean Board will continue to 
you know, fund me and let me keep doing some of this work. But um, that's where we're at right now. There's my contact information. Email is the best way to get me if you've got a question. Hey, guys and ladies. So I am Terry Newer. Just joined the Harry Hughes Center up at the Y Farm a couple months ago. Came out of agricultural education for 25 years. Yeah, we all know the state of public education. So we are doing a pub, um, sorry, a climate smart agriculture project. What's that mean? No, we're not going to fix the earth. We're not going to tell you what to do. Instead, my job is to listen to your voice, your story. What are your concerns? What are your questions? What are you seeing already with change in weather patterns? What are you trying or what ideas do you have that you'd like to see researched at the, at the farms, at the research farms, as a demonstration, even on your own property? These are the findings that I want to take share with a research team who's looking at climate data related to Maryland Ag. I'm talking to aquaculture, forestry, row crop, nursery. I'm talking to every sector I can get into, livestock, poultry as well. And I'd like to have you join my conversation about your ideas, what you're doing on your own farms, so that we can make some realistic proposals to the research team, figure out what, identi what to identify knowledge gaps that we have that we can then fund research for. Are there cost share ideas that you have? Are there policy BMP changes that you'd like to see to be more effective? I'm from Dorchester, ground zero. I just heard there's a salt tolerant soybean variety. I want to find out about that one because obviously that's a problem for us. So if you would like to join the conversation, I'm over here to the left of the donuts. <laughs> and um, I do have a door prize. If you'll provide me with your name and email, I have duct tape and WD-40 fixes everything. Thanks. Uh, good morning. I am Steven Roselle. I'm your local rep for TMAC Agro USA. Um, we're a little new in the area, so some of you may not have heard of us. We manufacture bionutritionals. And I can already hear your thoughts, what in the world is a bionutritional? So let's, let's break that down. Uh, nutritional, we offer balanced nutrient packages to deliver key nutrients to your crops. On the bio end, in those packages, we include some of our technologies, mainly in the form of patented complexes and plant extracts. Uh, and our goal with that is to increase microbial activity in your soil of the microbes that are already native and adapted to your soils, increase your plant nutrient uptake, and improve overall soil and plant health, all in one package. Um, we have over 40 different products, including liquids, additives, stabilizers, foliars, water solubles, so whatever your crop may be, however you're applying your nutrients, we have a solution for you. If you're interested, I'll be in there at the table with the blue tablecloth. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Um, before I get started for the grain producers, I just wanted to thank you guys for your support, your prayers, and your concerns over the past few months. Um, thankfully, Joey's home. He's got surgery for March 20th, um, and so he's been out in the tractor while he can, but thank you guys. Um, so as Jenny said, my name is Janelle Eck McHenry. I work for the Maryland Grain Producers. So we have the association and the utilization board. So on the membership side, we have been working in Annapolis. And I just wanted to give you guys a small update on PFOS is the one pesticide um, bill that's out. It hasn't made too much leadway in either committee. Um, but that's just kind of where we're at. And it's we are past the point of new bills unless it goes through the rules committee. So just a small update on the association and your membership dollars allow us to have that voice in Annapolis. So if you're not a member of the grain producers, um, stop by our booth and we're more than happy to get you guys enrolled. Um, newly this past year, we had a new scholarship program. We offered 
six different scholarships totaling $15,000 um, for members in ag, members not in ag, and then also non-members studying agriculture. So I just wanted you guys to know kind of what your checkoff money was being used for to support the future of our association and our organization. And then um, right now we have a CDL grant that's currently out, so we're offering two grants up to 1500 bucks um, to those people working to get their Class A commercial driver's license. We understand the challenges that it is for the young people to get their CDLs with the new regulations of having a 300-hour course that cost um, a few thousand dollars. So that is out and due May 4th. Fifth. So if you guys are interested or know anyone interested, please be in touch with us. Um, here on July 27th, we will have our Commodity Classic, so we'd love to have you all come out, um, enjoy some presentations, get some um, continued education credits, and then enjoy our speakers before crab fees. So please come and attend that. And then lastly, we also work for the Delaware, Maryland 4R Alliance, and this is the third and final year of a split nitrogen cost share program. So if you're looking to add an additional split of nitrogen to your corn crop this year, we are offering $15 an acre. So please see me, and I'd be happy to get you guys um, interested and talk more about that program. So that's all that I have. Thank you guys, and have a good one.